Our gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the 16th chapter of Matthew, beginning in the 13th verse. Listen for the word of God. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, and then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. I want to thank this morning uh, Barry Mentor for returning to lead us in music. Barry, it's nice and it's wonderful to have you back. And, uh, I also want to tell you that throughout the summer, um, Josh Stafford has joined us in worship planning and shared with us the hymn we just sung, which is being sung in Chautauqua this morning as well. And Josh will return next Sunday uh, to lead us once again. Barry, thank you. Uh, we have been blessed throughout the summer by magnificent leadership in music. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Yesterday in Jacksonville, Florida, a white man was arrested, or a white man armed with a high-powered rifle and a handgun killed three black people at a Dollar General store before shooting himself in what local law enforcement described as a racially motivated crime. The shooting was racially motivated and he hate, hated black people, Jacksonville Sheriff T.K. Waters told a press conference. The suspect, whom Waters described as a white male wearing a tactical vest, was not identified. Waters said all three victims, two men, and one woman were black. Waters said authorities believe the shooter acted alone, and before the shooting, he had auth authored several manifestos for media, his parents, and law enforcement dealing with his outright hatred of black people. Waters described his weapons as a Glock and an AR-15 style rifle with a swastika on it, referring to the lightweight semi-automatic long gun often used in mass shootings. It could have been August 14th, 2023, when six white former Mississippi police officers pled guilty to torturing two black men with tasers and a sex toy for 90 minutes after kicking in the door to the men's home without a warrant on January 24th of this year, the group which dubbed itself the Goon Squad taunted them with racial slurs, telling the men to stop taking advantage of white women who live there and to go back to Jackson or their side of the Pearl River. Only after a gun went off during a staged mock execution, shooting one of the men in the mouth, did the violence cease as they hastily tried to cover their tracks. The two victims survived. Though they will undoubtedly be scarred physically, they are, and emotionally by this experience for the rest of their lives. It could have been August 28, 1955, 
when two white men abducted a 14-year-old named Emmett Till from his uncle's home in the middle of the night. They took him at gunpoint, and then they tortured him and murdered him and threw him and his body in the Tallahatchie River, where they hoped his body would never be found. Although Emmett was found several days later, the two men were acquitted in a trial that took just weeks until they were called to trial, and they were acquitted in court. And then several months after that, protected by immunity, both men confessed for a certain price to Life magazine that they had murdered and tortured Emmett Till, and there were no cause and effect for their murder. And it could have been August 2023 in Columbus, Ohio, where there have been five police shooting deaths of black people on our streets in the past two months, not including the 21-year-old pregnant woman shot and killed while driving directly at a Blendon Township police officer on Friday the 25th as she attempted to flee the scene of her alleged shoplifting at, Sunbury Road, at a Sunbury Road liquor store. In my book, The Genius of Justice, I tell the stories of 53 people, geniuses of justice, 18 of whom are African American. In listening to the stories of their lives, it was apparent that every single African American in my book encountered racial injustice as children, teens, and young people growing up in America. In the book, I share six stories in the chapter, Racism and Pain, Moving Against Time. These six stories tell of white people stealing 1,100 acres of land over a lifetime earned from a former slave who had bought every one of those acres himself, stealing that land from him. And the, he was the grandfather of Otis Moss, Jr. Stories of church burnings and bombings, murders and tortures, beatings and abuse, verbal abuse of them as children, and physical and emotional abuse as well, threats of murder, racial divides, all because of color lines. Slavery, racism, and racial violence has criminally altered the lives and disrupted the families and destroyed generation after generation of people for 404 years in America. Besides these six black men who shared their painful and difficult stories of racism, the other 12 black women and men in my Genius of Justice project also tied their life experiences with racism and racial injustice all the way back to their childhoods. One thing was clear in the depth and breadth of the conversations. When I asked, how did you become the justice warrior you are today? all 18 African-American geniuses went back to childhood and the painful stories of their family's past and discrimina discrimination experiences that eventually shaped who they became. 100% of the men and women had firsthand experiences of racial injustice. For the 35 white people in my book, their encounters with racial injustice were all learned, not experienced. As I shared my discovery of experiential versus learned encounters with racial injustice with black friends and colleagues, they all agreed this matches their experience too. They have found that white people rarely have experienced life-shaping and soul-crushing pain in relation to injustice. Well, almost all of their black friends and family have encountered hardship in relationship to racial injustice. When I asked them what needs to be heard and what needs to be shared, they added their insights. Fred said, Tim, tell the truth about this. Jeffrey added, for over 400 years, African Americans have suffered from the effects of constant and continual abuse and the residual effects of PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, because our life story in America is packed with trauma and stress. Until we treat the cancer of racism, 
we will always battle the side effects and the after effects of its violence. Another friend said, tell people that this is not what you say, it's not what you say, but what you do that matters. How do you treat people in the workplace, in your neighborhood, in your school, in your daily interactions? That's what matters. Ray added, what also matters is that we see the larger issues of racism, the systematic injustices that prevail to this day. It is not enough to treat people well, although that is greatly appreciated. It is about changing systems that block advancement, opportunity, dignity, and equity. Kevin said, always remember that race itself is a social construct. It is not a real thing. So everything that follows is built on bad science and destructive systematic injustice. Also, we need to remember and celebrate the great achievements of black Americans who have led our nation in every single area of our life together. There is literally no area, he continues, where black Americans have not made advances and significant di differences in our nation's story. So I thank my friends for their additional insights. To deny the depths of racism in America and its lasting impact upon us to this present day is like denying the Holocaust ever happened or denying the Titanic never sunk, and so on and so forth. To deny the horrible presence and pain of racism in America before today and up to this present moment is like saying the sun didn't rise this morning. It is real, it is present, and it is a real and present danger today, just as it has been throughout our history. For black Americans, this is part of daily pain and experience. For white Americans, our encounters and experiences with racism and its deeply rooted twin named Caste, and I might remind you that in her book, Caste, Isabel Wilkerson describes racism as the skin of the issue and caste as the bones of the issue, right? It's the structure inside the body that caste represents. It is not felt in the bones by white people. It is not known in visceral realities, aggressions and microaggressions that are experienced regularly. As I have said many times, the first and most prevalent reality of white privilege is this, that as a white person, I can walk away from racism at any moment on any day. I can leave this pulpit today and never look back and never say another word and not care. That's privilege. That's white privilege. I saw this with the protests following the lynching and murder of George Floyd. There were a lot of white people who protested and then later walked away saying, well, I stood strong against racism, now it's over. Never to lift their voices again. In reality, we must commit each day of our lives to live and breathe, to act as anti-racists in America. I turn to literary genius and my guiding light on racial critique, James Baldwin, for direction and inspiration. James Baldwin once wrote, because even if I should speak, no one would believe me, and they would not believe me precisely because they know that what I said was true. Genius of physics and social analysis, Albert Einstein added, if the majority knew the roots of this evil, then the road to its cure would not be so long. So let us tell the story. In the words of Genesis 4.10, let us tell the story about our brothers and our sisters whose blood cries from the ground. There are 404 years and adding of, gen of genuine and justifiable anger in the soul of black America. In August 2019, I shared a six-part sermon series with three African-American colleagues entitled 400 Years of Africans in America. The scourge of American slavery 
and the mistreatment of black people in our land started on August 19, 1619. As the White Lion, the first slave ship in the colonies arrived at Point Comfort, what is now Hampton, Virginia. In what I call the true founding document of this nation, the Manifest of the White Lion, it records that 20 and odd, 20 and odd Africans had been captured from the slave ship San Juan Baptista in a fierce battle in the Bay of Campeche in, Campeche in the Gulf of Mexico, and now they were for sale in the land. We know two of their names, Antonio and Isabella. We know them only because they appear later in the records of their slave owners. The other names will ever, forever be unknown to us. There was no true accounting for the evil beginnings of slavery in America. This manifest needs to be put front and center in the National Archives moving the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights to the side so that when you walk in the building that John Russell Pope built, just as he built our church, you see that first. We need to own this as a founding document of our nation. For more than 400 years, we have reaped what we have sown, and these seeds of racism, bigotry, and hate continue to be sown and reaped today. We need to reap and sow a harvest of justice and not hate. We need to confront the machinery of systematic violence and injustice that African Americans endure. We can do this in many ways and in many places. Just pick a place to overcome racial injustice in America and get to work. We can work on social policies which call for the flourishing of all children especially those who have been left behind with inequities in American life. We can fight for health care protections for minority women, men, and families. We can address mental health concerns, and we can address prenatal health care, among other health crises in poor and minority communities. We can fight for equal education and against the burning and banning of books and historic truths and the bizarre right-wing attack on critical race theory. We can fight against redlining and fight for fair housing and justice for low-income people who need safe, secure, and affordable housing. We can fight against criminal just, a criminal justice system which is so often criminal and unjust, which is designed in its, in its lifetime to incarcerate and kill brown and black people. We can work on public transportation issues, immigration rights, capital punishment, and more. Each one of us can connect the dots of racial prejudice and pain to design and bring to fruition a better world of love and justice. And it can start today. This week marks the 404th anniversary of slaves arriving on the shores of America to be sold in the marketplace of injustice. So read the 1619 Project and read about the roots of racial injustice. Tomorrow marks the 68th anniversary of Emmett Till's abduction and murder. So read about this and share the story with your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Tomorrow marks the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. So watch all of the speeches that were given that day on YouTube, not just I have a dream, but everything else that was said to America to wake up and pay attention, crying to us 60 years ago. Honestly, this whole thing, the new social gospel, means absolutely nothing and will go absolutely nowhere if we do not deal with and heal America's original sin, the sin of slavery, and the stain and curse of racial injustice embedded in the soul of America. For Antonio and Isabella, for Emmett and the tens of millions of African-American women and children living still, 
let us commit today to be anti-racists and to work each day to right this wrong. Amen.